There he is. Yeah, it looks like a bark scorpion. An awfully big one. I don't know if that's the kind of guy I want to pop him off alive. See him nipping onto my finger there? Like I said, they're actually quite tasty. Interesting, that little uh, collage of scenes there ended up being something that I, I still do to this day, and I still like, at least in terms of doing a ser uh, an episodic uh, series, is just a 30 seconds or so of, of tease of what's coming up in the show. Not the, here's what's coming up in the episode kind of official device that way, but just, here's, this is what you got to look forward to. I, I still like doing that. The original theme. Me on base. For those of you who don't know, yes, I wrote all of that. I recorded it in my basement. The map graphic. Both North and Central America, the Sonoran Desert stretches from Mexico to Colorado, taking in both Arizona and California. At best, it may see 10 days of rain per year. In the desert, rivers have no water. Plants are so spiny that you dare not reach out to catch your fall. The dry heat and wind suck the moisture out of you quicker than you can replenish it. The animals here have to be prepared to survive the extremes. There is nothing average about this place. Ooh, that little shot of that burrowing, uh, not burrowing, but the, of that beautiful owl. I actually drove down to Tucson. Uh, there's a, like a, not a zoo, but a natural area there where they have all these hawks and owls. And so I went down there to get some of my um, B-roll shots of nature. It was, what a beautiful, I love, I do love Tucson, Arizona. It's very beautiful. Ah, the motorbike. This is the American Southwest. A desolate, rough, and rugged landscape. The hottest of the North American deserts. Anyone stranded out here has only two or three days to find water before they die of dehydration. For the unwary traveler, the desert can be deadly. Okay, full disclosure time. So, you have to remember, this is season one of Survivor Man. I'm now a brand new television producer. And I'm, I'm getting the lay of the land on how to do things. And I'm also being, not influenced, but pressured by uh, executive producers, both at the network and that I was working with, to do things, certain things a certain way. Uh, is that right? Am I telling the right story here? Back up. Sorry. That's for season two. Season one. I'm getting the lay of the land completely alone. I did not have anybody pressuring me. I did not have anybody that I was working with. Uh, I just was going out there to do it on my own. And um, I had connected up with a guy named Dave Brady to try and get the thing sold at the time. Um, and uh, it was actually me who, I, who was able to sell it to Anna Stambolic at uh, OLN in Canada first. Uh, there's a long story behind that, but let's, let's just go to this. So, trying to get the lay of the land, trying to figure out what to do, I realized early that I need to lay out a survival scenario for people so they could understand, and mostly so they could relate to what's going on. And in this case, well, what if I'm on a motorbike and it breaks down in the middle of the desert and I now have to survive, but I can rip the bike apart? That was my scenario. That's what I went down to Arizona thinking. So the first thing I did was I went to a wreckers and tried to find a... Um, a motorbike that I could tear apart. That took a while, but I did that. Secondly, I needed a bike that I could use for these opening scenes that I could actually ride. Well, here's the catch. I can't ride a motorcycle. I mean, I can. I can get it going. I can drive, but I can't ride like that. So in those little scenes, yeah, sorry. Sorry, folks. Yes, I've done everything myself, but in the season one, I was still trying to get a feel of things. And so in that scene, that's somebody else riding the bike. So I went and shot all these shots, right? And then when I went to place myself in the desert, I went off by myself and placed myself in the desert. But these opening scenes, yeah, there's a dude in Arizona. I think he's probably named in the credits. He was an awesome dirt bike rider. I tried, but it was too much bike for me not being a rider. And I know all you riders are looking at it going, come on, that's e well, easy for you because you first learned and trained. I didn't. I was just like, I once drove... Uh, a Honda around town once 
And so this is like the second time I'm on a bike. And I try. I was like, blah, hunk, blah, hunk. I couldn't, I couldn't make it work. I just said, you know what? Let's put, and I, and I strapped the camera to him and all that sort of stuff. And then shot him and just had him wear my clothes. So there you go. There is no Santa Claus, Virginia. One small mistake can turn an afternoon off-road drive. That's not me. It's a tragedy. After the crew shoots the opening scenes, they'll leave me alone with a broken down dirt bike in the middle of the desert. It's something that could happen to anyone, but in my case, at least I know that seven days later, my support crew will come looking for me. Oh, well, that's interesting scripting. Why did I say... See, again, this was one of those things where people couldn't get their heads around me filming everything by myself, so I actually referenced the crew had to drop me off, but this actually was a show shot before I had any crew at all. I literally flew down to Arizona by myself. By the way, it was total guerrilla shooting because I, I, I wasn't supposed to be doing that. I went down there by myself, uh, uh, and for legal reasons, I did get permission, permits later and got them all settled, and just had to find this place to, to shoot. So there was no crew. I don't even know why I said that. I guess it was because working with the editor, he was so caught in tradition and the way things are supposed to be that we would argue about this. Like, you got to say that or people won't get it. And I'll, more on that later on how that played out. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, the bike? <laughs> well, the camera crew took the good one ah. and left me alone with this piece so of junk. So when I say the camera crew took the good one, that actually guy, that was the, the actual rider that you just saw for a second there. Uh, and uh, yeah, so they left me with, this was the bike that I choose, uh, chose out of a uh, uh, yard. I can't, I don't know why I keep saying the camera crew because I'm trying to remember. Man, my brain is getting foggy these days, but nope, I was alone in Arizona. Yeah, totally alone. So again, it was just, oh, I'm supposed to say it this way so that the audience, so you guys understand, when in fact, I kept saying, they will understand, they will get it that I'm alone. Oh well. Alone for seven days. And one dead motorbike. <laughs> In that backpack is basically all my camera gear. This is not the place you want to be stranded. Sun setting quick. I've got some warmer clothes in the pack I'll put on. It's just way too late in the day now to make any kind of shelter. Oh, man. So I'm just going to sit here for the night. It gets really hot here during the day. Hot enough to dehydrate you quickly. But at night, it still gets below freezing. That was probably something I chose on purpose was to not be there when it was just insanely hot. Uh, but, of course, the sacrifice or the trade-off there is that, that it's going to be very cold at night. And it did. It got incredibly frosty. Um, yeah. Not sure what else to say about that soon. Let's keep going. You know, I will say that's something that I've often shown and taught when it comes to survival is everybody thinks they're going to make a big kick-ass shelter on that first night. You don't. In fact, you rarely make one even after a few nights. What you do is you end up sitting up against a tree, or in this case a bike, and trying to sleep through the night on your butt, freezing. It's horrible, to be honest with you. But I kept showing that, and people, oh, you got to build a shelter. It's like People lost in survival situations often don't build shelters, uh, and those first few nights are usually horrible. Day two. All right. Quick little thing here. Sorry. There's just so much involved here that it's hard for me not to just keep telling stories. But uh, do you know at that, there are a number of things that I had to do for Survivor Man that I will say it this way, pardon the braggadocio, but that had never been done before. Now what I had to do, I had to do out of necessity. I was alone filming this multi-day thing. So the, the devices, if you will, that I came up with, totally born out of necessity. 
Later on, you would see shows trying to copy Survivor Man doing the same devices. Like, you don't even need to do that. You have a crew there. Why, Bear Grylls, are you pretending to hold the camera? Oh, I'm walking along here. Right, and that's it really tough as I come along this desert here, but, you know, I'm going to be in a hotel later tonight, so, you know. And you'll see, you know, I, there's a scene. He reaches out, and he's holding the cameraman's lens as if he's filming himself. Like, who? Right. Like Survivor Man. And so... There were these devices that I had to do. Again, pardon the braggadocio, but man, on the other hand, I'm quite proud of things that I came up with. So, the day markers. There were no series ever showing day markers, nothing like that. And I thought, this is, people need to know what day it is, how long this has taken me, how long it's going. And it, that worked really well because people go, man, when I saw that day four marker, I thought, man, it's day four and he hasn't eaten anything yet. So, that was the reaction I wanted. And so, the edit editing device, this was before Barry Farrell came in to edit, when my, the genius who really took Survivor Man to the next level. So before that, but still the day markers, uh, they stayed for a long time because they work. Six. Six more days to go. Well, I certainly didn't sleep much last night. True story. Got pretty cold. Enough to put frost on the bike and everywhere else too. Let's see, I've got my camera gear. I've got basically just the clothes on my back, enough, enough water for a f couple of days anyway, a few days, although it's getting up to 80 degrees and 90 degrees every day. Reason for the water is this. One thing I can't do on this show is completely go without water. You have to, even in all those other copycat shows that came along, they have to establish a place where there is drinkable water. Without drinkable water, it's over in two days, every time. So. In this case, there's no water where I was, so, all right, let's set the scenario up. I'm, I, the scenario is I was on a motorbike and I had some water with me, and so there we go. That allows for the water. Uh, still, one jug, one gallon of water for seven days. That ain't a lot. And I should have just one snack bar. For seven days. Well... Let's see what I can get off of this bike anyway. This was a lesson. Learning that, um, the sun's been up for barely 10, 15 minutes. Already it's getting hot. You know, if you're lost in the, middle of the desert, with little chance of rescue, there's no point in being squeamish about your equipment. I'm gonna vandalize this thing. See what I can use. Right, so the idea here is uh, showing how you can do this, but I learned some big lessons about that. You cannot take apart a motorcycle or a car with a multi-tool. You can't do it. So the whole idea is, why didn't you just rip apart this and that? You can't just rip apart a vehicle. You need some big tools. So you get what you can. That could come in handy. Get a couple more of those. This MacGyverisms, and, and, and you guys have heard me call it that in other directors' commentary, the MacGyverism this angle. This is what something that, that I, we would started calling it was, oh, what's the MacGyverism in the show? Well, it was ripping apart this bike. Actually, I always really enjoyed that aspect. I always enjoyed, and I'm not an engineer. An engineer would do so much better. Someone with an engineer's brain. I was needs. I have a need, and I have to fill that, fulfill that need, and I have this bike, and I can rip it apart. What can I do here? So an engineer can make things really pretty, but I understood survival, and I did enjoy the uh, MacGyverism side of this. Cordage. You always need rope when you're lost or stranded. All right, I've managed to scrounge up a few things off the bike. Got some rope material. Maybe make something for digging out of this. And I got these prongs, they're not prongs, I've got these spokes, which I can use like a three-pronged spear. Um, I've got the, I'll probably do something with the seat, but the only thing I left back there was the rubber tires, and I can cut them off later and either burn them for black smoke at a, as a signal fire or make strapping out of them. But this area has no shade for me, and it's pretty dusty, and it's getting hot, so I'm gonna see if I can find a better location. And also, maybe some food. So, a little talk uh, about how that before this, I shot this episode, this was the time that I went down and uh, met Desert Dave, Dave Halliday, survival guru, uh, a mentor of mine and a very good friend of mine. 
And I spent five days with him out in the desert learning whatever he could teach me. So I did that before shooting this show because the whole idea was I wanted to have a brain full of information that I could then impart to you as I affected my own survival. And so if you want to uh, learn from the best, find yourself in the presence of Desert Dave Halliday. By the way, I'm the guy who nicknamed him Desert Dave. Uh, and uh, he is in um, Boulder, not Boulder, Colorado. He's in Boulder, Utah. Uh, and he's often, you know, working with a uh, boss, B-O-S-S, uh, um, and teaches all around. So there you go. This is all so new to me. Below freezing at night and intensely hot during the day. And as far as I can see, rocks and cactus. Yeah, ugly khaki clothing. Like water here. You know, walking down through this wash here is about the flattest area I can find. Whenever I thought of the desert, I always thought of it being pretty flat, you know? Flat and sandy. In fact, it's anything but. It's uh, all rock and hills, some of them quite steep. And just about every single plant that you uh, pass wants to stick you with something. This was the birth of the bandana. So it's funny, just last night I was watching something, Alice Cooper was speaking on, he was talking about how Alice Cooper is a character that he created. And I didn't realize this, it was actually a special about the, uh, the TV series called The Midnight Special. Those of you in my age bracket will know what I'm talking about. Fantastic music program. Don Kirshner's Rock Concert and The Midnight Special with Wolfman Jack. And Alice Cooper was being interviewed and he said, you know, Alice, Al Alice Cooper, as Vincent Fernier was being interviewed, and he was saying that Alice Cooper is a character he created. And so when he hosted that show, they didn't let him speak. And he said, Alice Cooper never speaks, ever. Never talks to the audience. He plays out a role on stage. And I thought, damn, he's right. Never saw him talk on stage, seen him several times. I know, uh, I know Coop uh, well enough, he's a friend. Uh, I can call him a friend and acquaintance. I say that because I, I, you know, he was an idol when I was a kid, but I got to know him and I performed with him. And I thought, you know, it's the same thing with Survivor Man. For me, there's like Les Stroud, I'm Les Stroud right now talking to you about this Survivor Man series. But Survivor Man happens when I put that bandana on. That's my super cape. And I have met people. Oh, here's a story. I was signing autographs one time after a concert, and I'm blinged out as a rock musician playing my show. A woman came in. She goes, well, I want to get a picture with you, but that's not the Survivor Man I know. Can you please take off that hat? I should have said no. But anyway, I took the hat off, and she goes, okay, even though without the bandana, maybe I fat grabbed a bandana and put it on. That's the Survivor Man she knew and loved, if you will. I always recognize the power of that bandana. Every time I step over one of those little plants, it makes it sound like a rattler snake. As dorky as the banana, that bandana looks. I'm just gonna stroll a ways, see what I can find. Make some wild edibles. It really doesn't matter where you look around here. It's just desert, as far as you can see. And Case in point, in terms of camera shooting, nobody, you know, people didn't follow along their feet on the ground until after Survivor Man. Um, but that was something. I, I had to find a way with one singular camera while I was moving to tell the story of my movement. So, film my feet walking along the ground, but not, not beautifully shot where I, you know, uh, where there's someone else moving the camera. I was just like, well, I didn't have time to set up camera angles and do all that. Not, sometimes I did, but lots of times I didn't. And so just film my darn feet, and show the shot, tell the story. Let me show you what I'm seeing. More than 100,000 square miles. That's the Sonora Desert. <clears throat> These washes are a good place to find different variety of plants for eating, that's for sure. It's not the snakes and scorpions that worry me. It's running into a pack of wild peccaries. They're vicious little guys and their tracks are all over this place. They're kind of like pigs or wild boars. And they may have terrible eyesight, but their sense of smell is excellent. And they'll attack you in numbers in an unorganized and wild fashion. That shot of that peccary is actually from my camera. It's, that's not a, a faked in zoo shot or anything like that. I shot that, I think I probably, but I did shoot it probably the week before um, while I was training maybe, or maybe it was just there. I can't remember. I can't remember, to be honest with you, but that's my shot, uh, and it's definitely not in a zoo. And they are vicious. Ask anybody who's ever had to deal with or knows about peccaries. 
dangerous animal. They'll attack you en masse with a hundred individuals and the only thing that'll be left behind are your shoes when they, people come to not find you. These Christmas choya look like they'd be nice and juicy and you just pick some off and rub off the fluffy hairs on them and pop them in your mouth and they'd be good. Well, in fact, it's true, they are good to eat. They were even part of the traditional diet in this area. What they're covered with are little spines called uh, glockids. And if you don't get, if you miss one glockid and leave it on there and pop that in your mouth, you're gonna know about it for days. It sticks in your tongue and it just aches. So you really have to clean them off. There's a story, uh, you can look it up actually, it's, it's in another YouTube video. Uh, I'll try to remember what the, uh, the link is and I'll put it down below in the, in the link section there. Uh, that um, I tell about how David Halliday, after he's finished teaching me, he taught me about this, this berry. He taught me all of this stuff. And um, later on, uh, he was, they were watching this for the first time ever over at uh, Boulder Outdoor, Outdoor School of Survival and all his buddies are there and they're like, Dave, he's just like, he's just saying what you say. To, and Dave got it. He knew right away. He goes, yeah. He goes, and you know what? Les never took a single note. So how is he repeating me verbatim without ever having taken a single note? He knew that I was passionate about the information he was giving me and that I loved it. I didn't need to write any notes down. He was t teaching me stuff that I wanted to learn. And I learned it. And then I repeated it on camera because that's what I do. I present. And uh, so thank you, Dave, because I know Dave was always very proud of that fact. Well, they'd be like, oh, he's ripping you off. I wasn't ripping Dave off at all. I was paying homage to him. And on it goes until it's completely clean of all the glockets. <sighs> okay, there, I just spent like maybe 10 minutes just trying to get all the tiny, tiny little hair-like glockets off of this Christmas joya. It's good, just a lot of work. I gotta find a way of staying warmer tonight, getting up off the ground and protected from above. This grass should go a long way towards helping me stay warm. But I'm using my gloves because what makes me really nervous here is this is a perfect place for rattlesnakes to be laying. They like the heat of the grass. There must be some moisture under the ground here for all of this cariso cane to be growing here. I've got my blanket with my grass. I'll use this cariso cane for, uh, for my mattress, I hope. And I was hoping to turn this bed into something comfortable. The sun's setting pretty quickly, as always. Another case in point right there. Another thing. On the odd blue chip documentary, you would see sunrises and sunsets. They would take a time and have a beautiful camera set up and capture it. You never saw it, though, in regular, you know, series like this or anything. But I realized, like, what a great way to let people know without saying anything that we're going into another day, even though I would put the day markers later to be clear about it. And uh, then it became ubiquitous. And I, I know, I, I know I'm bragging. I know I'm laying claim to certain things in terms of this, the, uh, what you see on television today, but hell, history bears me out. And Survivor Man was the start, by necessity, of a lot of devices used in television today. Uh, and I could, I could go on. There's, there's, a good, there's a few of them. And I, again, I'm proud of that fact, but here we go. You know what? You keep watching. I gotta go grab something. There, when I do finally settle in, it'll be something like this. Who knows, might even be, might even be warm. I sure hope there's no spiders in there. Black Widow, that is. Oh, comfy. I knew that seat would be good for something. Well, it was pretty warm for most of the night underneath that grass. Last little bit of the night, the frost came in and a 
started to get a bit chilled then. And with the sun coming up, it actually doesn't hit down in my gully soon enough. So I'm up here to catch some morning rays. A little comment about using the grass like that. You want a fast shelter in the wilderness? Fastest, easiest one ever. Assuming you have lots of foliage on the ground. Like it's the fall here right now. There's a, just a football field full of leaves on the ground right now. Just make a big pile of leaves or ferns or whatever leaves type, leaf type material you can. Make a massive pile. Climb in the middle of it. That'll be one of the warmest shelters you've ever slept in. You haven't tried that one yet and making your survival shelters? Try that one. Just make a massive pile of leaves. Do it in your backyard. Use the rake. Use a, a tarp to gather them all and dump them. Make a pile about as high as your shoulders at least and as lo longer than your body and then crawl into the middle of that. You will be, uh, I often, I end up being too hot. So try that out. It's probably one of my favorite survival shelters and it doesn't get any any uh, credit for being uh, the amazing shelter that it is. I'm gonna see if I can weave that, uh, that grass together into a, a mattress and into a, a blanket and, uh, and see if I can maybe get a fire going as well. Okay now, I've stripped, a, stripped apart all of the wiring that I had taken off of the uh, motorbike. And now I'm just gonna make all this grass into these long, long sort of cylinders here. And I'll start to uh, tie them together in bundles. Sort of you just come through, make a bundle like this, and then uh, go around the next one in the opposite direction. This is absolutely a David Halliday and lesson that I got the week before. I'm gonna pull the whole thing together. It's so simple and, and so obvious. Weave through my wiring to tie this whole bit of grass together. And then what that'll do is uh, give me a, basically a, a good portable mattress and a good solid mattress that'll hold together well for me. There we go. Just enough wire to make a bed. I'll try for some fire now. This seat cover will work as a good base for my fire starting to keep things out of the sand. First, I'm gonna give a good effort to get fire going by using traditional method of this area, the hand drill, very primitive method. What I've done is, first of all, I, I got all my tinder bundle, my grass together by hammering it with a rock and making some powder and putting a powder in the middle. And you kind of wrap it with some other grass. And I actually used one of my wires from the motorbike to tie it off and make myself the fire bundle here. I found this spindle just uh, while I was down getting the creso cane. It's a piece of seep willow. And the baseboard that I'm using is uh, one of the ribs of the Sororo cactus. Uh, you know, it's, I forgot about that. I mean, this is one of the techniques I often use as a filmmaker is, is, is the insertion shot, uh, the cutaway. But the cutaway to something that's happened before. And even right now in my series Wild Harvest, there's Les Stroud's Wild Harvest uh, showing on PBS stations in the United States and um, Cottage Life Television in Canada, around the world on National Geographic in Asia, uh, and Mant Kennelen, anyway, the Food Network of Norway and, and, uh, and Sweden. And in there, often I will have to do some gathering out off season when I'm not with Chef Paul Rogalski. So I just shoot all that. And then later, it just, just like that, you know, you splice that in, saying, oh, well, I did the, I'm talking in camera going, I did this, I did that, I did this. But then you get to see it happening while I'm talking. It's great because it's not narration at that point. It is narration, but it's not. It's more in the moment. I love it. I love that as a technique. Uh, all dead and dried out, and I've just sort of Case whittled it down to, to be the right shape for me to work with here. The other thing I did was make this fire lay over here ready to go, just a stick stuck in the ground, and then all the other, the heavier wood put on top. And that way, when your grass goes underneath to, to light up, the heavy wood doesn't crush it, and you, you can get a nice, good aerated fire to get it going. That's absolutely a David Halliday tip right there. Um, uh, I'd forgotten about that one, the, uh, the fire lay. Huh. Now, to get to do this right, First I had to just find the right place and then uh, once I've got the, the spindle settling on the baseboard, I cut out a little notch and that'll give a place for all the hot dust to fall down into. Now what I was showing was to try and keep this motion going, if you do the kind of the, the itsy bitsy spider move. That's a Dave Halliday move, big time. Itsy bitsy spider. To get the motion right of what it is you want to do while you make this thing spin. This is 
one of the tougher ways to get a fire going. Absolutely. Hard on the hands. You gotta take your rings off or it'll kill you. But uh, Dave and I worked a lot on this the week really before. Spinning in one spot like this and you're just doing little short ones, it's a lot tougher to get it going. So that's the motion I wanna try and keep happening. Until I can make it. The last thing is, as you can see, I've been practicing. It's from these blister marks. It's really easy to get blisters doing this. And so, when you, as soon as you're sort of stopped, you smack your hands together really hard, so hard that it hurts. But that rushes the blood back into the skin and helps anyway to, to prevent the blisters from coming on. Let's give this a try. This was tough. This was really tough. And I did practice at this one. Normally my technique is to not practice, but to try something brand new for you on camera that I've never done before. But this was a little different. I really wanted to succeed at this, so I did get this skill set uh, within my system so that I could hopefully be successful here. But it's a tough way to get a fire going. Back before I had uh, any music really produced for me, the, pain as your hands get the editor was just using padded music. But it worked, good choices. There we go. Still though. It's like one shot at it here. In the bundle. Ah, carefully. It's amazing, that little ember is, imagine knocking the ember off of the end of a cigarette. It'll hold, you can move it around and then blow it into flame, but it's still really delicate. You could also crush it really easily. So it's halfway between being incredibly fragile and, uh, and decently robust. Notice I'm not talking? It's like, screw the cameras, man. I gotta get this fire. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Ooh, doesn't that look good? Woo! No cold, no more cold nights for me. Ugh. It's gonna be a warm night, and it's gonna keep the peccaries and the mountain lions away from me. This brings in a whole new element of psychological comfort. Yeah. And you know, the beauty about fire in the desert is that there's just dry firewood everywhere under the mesquite trees and, and different, all, everything's gnarled and dried up and dead. So uh, I'll be able to keep this fire going for a good long time. This is great. Quick little story. Ran into somebody out there. Yeah, that's happened a couple of times in Survive Man. Just some guy comes walking along, he was out hunting deer. Young guy, 20s maybe, and uh, we, we chatted and, and uh, he walked away. That was the end of it. It was like 15 minutes. Hey, how's it going? Oh, I'm just hunting deer. What you doing? Oh, you know, just, uh, just making a little film out here, just hanging out. Okay. Bye. That's happened uh, once, twice, three times. I think it's happened three, maybe four times over you know, 18 years of, of producing. There he is. Ah. Yeah, it looks like a bark <clears throat> scorpion. Little scorpion. An awfully thing here. big one. Ooh, and he wants to sting me. Look at that thing. The way to eat these guys, what you want to do is hold them down and just cut off the stinger. Look at him trying to sting that. So once you can get the stinger cut off. There. Okay. Now, he shouldn't be much of a problem. Ow! See him nipping onto my finger there? He's Ow! That's a Dave Halliday trick. Uh. Like the pinch onto your tongue. Story about this. Like I said, they're actually quite tasty. Pretty good. Tastes like a little shrimp. Mmm. <laughs> Not bad at all. 
Can't believe I just did that. <laughs> Not bad at all. Mmm. Definitely a bark scorpion. Nice and tasty. Getting loopy there, I think, because it's into the third day now. Story about the scorpion thing. And it's a Bear grill story. A couple years later, uh, when, uh, long story short, when they decided to uh, copy the Survivor Man show and make Man vs. Wild, they, well, actually, the producers were actually taxed with, they were literally told, go everywhere less has been. Literally. So they did. They went, to, they went to Arizona. They went to the, I'm not sure if it was Arizona, but they went to the desert. They got David Halliday. So David Halliday went and worked for them. He knows, he, he'll tell this story. He, he won't mind me sharing it. And David taught him the scorpion thing. And then Bear did the scorpion thing on his show. This is like two years, three years after I did it. And uh, David has told me, like, you know, it was one of his regrets in his career and his life was that he, he did do that time with Bear Grylls, that he showed the same secrets to Bear Grylls, only to see the way it was going to be treated on Man vs. Wild as just, you know, all faked when everybody's, you know, they're all going back to the hotel every night and they're just setting it up. And uh, he also taught Bear how to do a firebow. So on set is where Bear Grylls learned how to do a firebow for the very first time. Uh, and David Halliday taught him that. Uh, he used to walk around the set kicking at things, going, I hate this survival shit. All of that witnessed by David. And uh, so Dave regrets that scenario. Uh, but as I said, Dave and I have remained friends to this day. And I will never let him live it down that he went and did that. Because it was like, you just stole... He just stole my thunder in so many ways, but the scorpion, really? Come on, that was mine. No one had ever shown that. Well, until it got copied. There you go, a little behind the scenes, uh, nasty TV world story stuff. All this creosote bush is a, a great plan of the desert. I can use it to make a smudge fire, to actually to cleanse myself. It's also good that's about the only thing you can really kind of use when you got to go to the bathroom. Creosote bush has 69 different chemicals that, uh, that bugs and uh, fungus and, and different bacteria don't like. So it's a very good, powerful plant for an awful lot of uses. There may be no... That the edible wild and medicinal wild and useful wild plant part, part of Survivor Man will always, always remain as my favorite part of survival skills bar none, which is why I now have the series uh, Wild Outside. Wild Outside, sorry. That's my new children's book. I have the series Wild Harvest, Lester Isles Wild Harvest. Water for washing up out here, but you can still feel fresh. The sweet smoke of the creosote bush actually kills much of the bacteria that causes body odor. Before we get into this next stage, let me just pause for this mid video commercial but if you're wondering how you can see the entire survivor man episode well, uh, a series well first of all you can on this youtube channel check the playlists that's the key to this channel by the way check the playlists there's the bigfoot playlist there's beyond survival survivor man the various seasons there's podcast music everything all here but if you really want to have something very cool in your hands this is the survivor man let us 20th anniversary film collection and this includes everything I've ever done. It's over, I think, 76 films is in this package of everything I've ever done. Of course, naturally, you've got, you know, Survivor Man work, the beginning stuff, No Shoes in Solitude, Off the Grid, all the seasons of Survivor Man, Beyond Survival. Everything I've ever done is right here. And uh, you can get it on uh, the website, lestrad.ca, shop page. Check it out. That is an amazing Christmas gift to give to yourself. Okay, back to the movie. Most fear is born of ignorance. The sound of the desert seems benign, not spooky like a jungle at night. Here, it's birds chirping, the dry breeze, but scorpions, black widows, and rattlesnakes. That's what lie behind the rocks and in the grass. That's what can get into your mind and create fear. Yet the desert, as dry and hot as it is, has been called home by humans for thousands of years. That was about a lot of people saying, what are the dangers, what are the dangers, what are the dangers? And then there became this refrain with the Discovery Channel anyway, which is, well, what are the stakes, Les? We have to know what the stakes are. I was like, oh, God, okay. The, you know, yeah, fine. It was just based on 
fear of the natural world, and I, and I never liked instilling fear into the, in the natural world. Now, I don't mind mentioning the dangers, and I don't even mind sort of saying, well, here's what the stakes are, but I don't want to over-sensationalize them. And i got to check, because I might be wrong about who edited this show. I'll, I'll see when I get to the end. This might have been actually Richard Mandon, and he, he did a great job. I'm really enjoying this edit, actually. This is an amazing find. All this wall along here is not natural. It's man-made. Man-made over a thousand years ago. There's chert here that came from a great distance away through trade networks. Lots of pottery. You know, the camera's sitting in a ruin. There's ruins in all behind me there. This whole hilltop is just one massive multi-room complex. Some people believe that the Pueblo who lived here were actually under a bit of a slavery to the Hohokam and the mound builders from the east, that style of, of peoples. And around 800 years ago, they simply got fed up and abandoned all of these places, went on to more fertile ground. These stones here, very obviously brought in. This one here, you can tell, was a bit of a grinding stone. You can even see the scoring from the grinding, perhaps used to make jewelry of some sort. This kind of information would lead me to one day produce the series Beyond Survival because I just became fascinated in that relationship between ancient Earth peoples, modern Earth peoples, and just survival itself. It's fascinating. These cactus here are kind of famous. It's called barrel cactus. And it's said that if you slice them open and open them up, that uh, they're full of water and you can drink it. And in fact, you see them all growing often over to the side. Supposedly, that's because of the weight of the water. Well, that's not true at all. In fact, they're growing over to the side because they're following the sun, just like many plants and flowers. If you do slice them open and try to drink the stuff, it's very slimy. And it actually ends up being worse for you uh, in the end. In fact, it can bring your core temperature down, which can give you some really bad nighttime chills. I suppose that's pretty good in the middle of the day when it's really hot, but the fact is that they don't rehydrate you at all. It's a very slimy, very pasty, slimy kind of substance. So, But what they are good for, you can also get the fruits. You know, one of the things I, I loved about a scenario like that is I love demystifying things in survival because there's a lot of, there's a lot of crap in the books. And there's a lot of crap on the shows that followed Survivor Man that just isn't true. And I love to demystify things and uh, say, yeah, you know, that's, that's, that was just a, as they would call it, you know, an urban legend or an old wives' tale or whatever you want to term it. Bottom line is, let's get to actual survival techniques that actually work. That's what I like to show. Oh! Ow! Oh, that hurt. Oh, that hurt. Big time. Ugh. Sorry, I guess he didn't like me taking his fruit just yet. What you do is you don't eat the whole thing. You open this up. The inside, there's a whole, whole bunch of little black seeds. And they're tasty. Mmm. Again, if you want to see this really put to the test, watch the series Les Stroud's Wild Harvest, uh, and it's also on this YouTube channel. There's no point in rationing water in the desert. The moisture is sucked from your body in this dry heat so quick that you can't hope to quench your thirst. With only a few sips a day, my water is almost gone. I've got to find an oasis in this place. Heat of the day like this, all you really want to do is lay around in the shade. Not much left of my energy bar. I'm gonna go find some more food. Oh yeah. These little guys are awesome. Strawberry pincushion. And by far, the most tastiest treat in the desert, I think. Mmm. Oh, mm, yeah. They're like a combination between a strawberry crossed with a kiwi. Oh, man, is that good? Bring my blood sugar level up a notch. 
Mm. Oh yeah, this is the plant you want to find. This is what I'm enjoying so much now about producing wild harvest is it's just all about gathering wild edible plants, local foraging. And that's a fun part of survival skills. Next thing I want to do is uh, take my digging stick, the one that I put in the fire, underneath the fire to harden, and I'm going to turn it into a spear by using these uh, spokes from the motorbike. And I can grind them to a point either on a rock or, if I want, the multi-tool has a uh, great file on it just to get them into a nice sharp point. Once I've got that happening, though, I'm going to take the three of them using the C-clamp that I got from, uh, from the motorbike. I can strap them onto here probably pretty good, pretty tight. Okay, there. I now have a very functional three-pronged spear. This gives me a confidence boost because it helps me with protection against mountain lions and, and peccaries, the javeline, which uh, at nighttime still always give you a bit of the spook. It's always said that people can last three to five days without water, but here in the desert, the wind is so dry and the heat so stifling that it sucks the moisture right out of you, reducing your survival time. I can't see making it to five days without water in a place like this. Roughly speaking, that's true. Yes, it depends on the body, the person, the time, the, the temperatures, everything. There's a lot of variables there, and that's a problem with survival. What's the number one thing you need to take in on a survival situation less? What's the number one tool you should... Variables, variables, variables. It depends. It all depends. And water, and in terms of dehydration, well, there are stories of people gone 11 days without a drop of water and still survived. Uh, then there's the marathon runners in the deserts that do these things. Um, so it all depends. But generally speaking, yes, you know, you've got that three-day rule. And here's the, here's the catch. It's not whether or not you can still survive after three days. It's are you lucid? Are you able? Can you even get up from where you are? So you might be able to last much longer than three days, but can you accomplish anything? That's really the challenge because once those migraines kick in and the lethargy uh, uh, takes over your, your, your whole system, you can't accomplish much. And so then survival goes downhill pretty quickly. I'm finding it really hard to ration my water and I still got four days to go. I should really think about maybe finding another water source. It's not that it's really hot. It's about high 70s or so during the day, but it's so dry, it just sucks the moisture right out of you. I'm already starting to get dehydration headaches. Whether I like it or not, I'm going to have to leave this little spot if I want to survive the week. I'm gonna have to go up and over a few hills to see if I can find a place with some water. Some areas of the desert, you can walk a few miles, find some water in other areas. You can walk 60 miles and not find any. Sonora Desert is 100,000 square miles. That's a lot of desert. Traveling through this desert is anything but easy. Every plant stabs with its spine. Every rock shifts under my feet. When I climb the hills, I have to remain ever mindful of not putting my hand within striking distance of a rattlesnake sunning itself in the heat of the day. Water. I've got to find a good source of water. All day I've been suffering from fatigue and dehydration headaches. If I can spot a valley with a green belt in the middle... So, case in point, that shot of showing me travel like that, that was necessity. I had to drop the camera, go and film all of that, come back and get the camera. So by necessity, in the edit suite, it was like, well, let's just shoot it like that to show your travel, because it's too long otherwise. And then I would start to see other shows doing that exact same editing technique, even though they had crews that they could have shot it much more beautifully. Um, this, this also represents a time in the production of Survivor Man when I realized that uh, travel was always going to be difficult. I had all that camera gear to carry with me. And in the end, I really could mostly only do survival shows where I stayed put. 
This put me at a disadvantage, by the way, when, when Man vs. Wild came along, because they could have him traipsing all over the country, and because they would just pick him up and take him where they wanted to get a cool shot, and they did. Oh, we'll fly, chopper you over here, we'll drive you over there. So they just did that all the time. I didn't want to do that. It's, it's, it was, first of all, that, that would be not the show. That'd be, that'd be just making a scripted show. So t me and traveling and survival uh, and producing this series didn't go together so well, so it was tough. I had to keep everything based on staying put, which is fine. It opens up a whole other world, but uh, it would have been cool if I could have shown more survival or more travel. It may mean running water or maybe even a small river. This is tough hiking. It's a couple of miles since my last camp, but I'm looking down there and I think I can hear the sound of water and I think I might have found myself a nice little gorge to get down into. I can see the type of vegetation, it's called the riparian zone, where I'm starting to see sycamore and, and been walking through all this mesquite, so there's been a change. I think I might have found my new home. That was actually a lucky find because David didn't show me the water where that was. The water. What was that little glitch I just saw there? That was interesting. Must have been Water a, a bird go by or something. I think I might have found myself a nice little gorge to get down into. I can see the type of vegetation. It's called the riparian zone. Okay, coming up. Where I'm starting to see sycamore and and been walking through all this mesquite, so there's been a change. <sighs> I think I might have found my new home. I can. Huh, interesting. In the time lapse. Uh, no, I can't do it with this setup. But in the time lapse, something goes across. It's probably me walking across in front. Um, David Halliday did not tell me where this water was. That was actually something I just was able to find by checking out all of the uh, ecosystems around me. Uh, and it was lucky because uh, it was a desert and didn't have much water. Hear the water. I can smell the water. It smells fresh and clean. This little paradise is about five miles and a few hills from my first camp, and I couldn't really film that. And of course, because I have too much camera gear, I had to hike it twice just to get all the gear here. But I'll tell you, that was a mistake. I had too much camera gear. That's why, I, that, this was the show that said, you can't travel less, just don't do it. Uh, long hike, and no, I can't film at all. I got to do that hike and get it over with. So there's a whole, what's that mean? It means I'm losing a day of filming just to get somewhere. That became a problem. It, was, it, took me, it took me all of season one to figure out what I would do about that and more of that in later director's commentaries to come. Yeah, this little desert creek, man, this is a sight for sore eyes. This is like Shangri-La. Water. Oh, this is beautiful. Always comes down to water. Fresh, clear, cold water. Here's a classic scene for me. Yeah. yeah, it was such a beautiful place that I wasn't thinking as much about survival as I should have been. Barely noticing that I was only peeing once a day and it was very dark, indicating dehydration. I may still be losing weight due to a lack of nutrition, but at least I can stay hydrated now and keep clear of heat stroke. Yeah, the, the water thing, right? And I, I'm not sure if I've said this in other director's commentaries, but everybody's always so afraid of Jardia and it's such, a rare situation to, I know some of you go, I got Jardia. Okay, yes, you can get it. But the reality is dehydration is worse than Jardia. You get Jardia, you don't know for seven days, and then you, you know, assuming you're out in civilization, you take a pill, it's gone. So, uh, and in fact, in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, there's more than 500 cases of Jardia every year. And we know where those cases exist? In the daycare centers. Right. Kids touching themselves, touching each other, all of that. This is, we're talking pre-COVID, right? Well, uh, I would rather be hydrated and vibrant and awake than dehydrated and, and uh, lethargic uh, just because I would be worried about Jardia. I don't, I don't worry about it. Uh, and uh, there you go. There's my stance on it. We can discuss that deeper if you like. Now this is an oasis for survival, but I still need to get my fire going. Well, I banked up all these stones and made myself a little sort of pad here. I'm gonna sleep underneath this juniper tree. 
It's a great place to sleep. It keeps the dew off you at night. And uh, there seems to be some sort of residual heat that stays underneath these trees. They're a great place to sleep underneath when you're out here. Sun's setting pretty quick. That was an awfully long day just getting here. But I am now in paradise, it would seem. Paradise in the middle of the desert. These age-old traditional skills are helping to keep my mind off my ever-growing hunger. You know, it just amazes me how long the small wood in the desert stays burning nicely. This, the wood, I'm getting it from the mesquite trees. And uh, it just, an arm load lasts me all night long. In Canada, I'd need at least five or ten times that much with spruce and pine. So it's great. You just got a nice little low fire going all night long. And this is a good spot. It's frosty cold out everywhere else, but underneath this juniper tree, it does feel a little bit warmer for some reason. And of course, I'm not, I've got no frost on me. Ah, oh, this is nice. Now that I'm settled in here, I'll just keep drinking tons and tons of water all day to try and kill the desire for food because I am getting, I'm just really hungry. Uh, but that's what I gotta go do, start looking for some more food. Um, but thankful that the water's there. Case in point about that. That is a technique that I still espouse a lot for uh, surviving in the wilderness. If you are near a fresh source of drinking water, and there's lots of it, drink as much as you can as often as you can. In other words, guzzle every half hour if you can. And what that does is it keeps the stomach feeling a little full and uh, it tricks you so that you're not feeling like you're starving all the time. It's a technique I've used a lot and uh, it, you're hydrated beautifully, uh, you're peeing clear, uh, you just don't have any food, so that fills up that hole uh, in, inside you, that stomach cavity, and uh, it works. This juniper, I chewed on a little sprig of this juniper last night just before bed, and the chemicals in it, it seems to work on the bacteria. I wake up in the morning and mouth tastes pretty fresh, actually. It also works so well enough so that I can have another smoke bath. Full on David Halliday tip there. Ah, fresh and clean. This agave is a very useful plant. And if you're careful, it has a neat trick. So this was something that David showed me the week before. And as soon as he showed me, I thought, that is cinematic brilliance right there. That is going to be beautiful. And uh, so he showed me, and I still love this scene. That you can do in case you need a needle and thread. If you're really careful, ow! Really careful. I just love the look of that spike right by my eye. It's one of those moments I wasn't sure if it was even going to work, and it worked beautifully. You can actually pull yourself out a needle and thread. That spike from the top of the agave plant, and I just bit below it to break the fibers, and then I got a really oh, strong... Come on, I mean, how cool is that, really? Here, super strong. I mean, I can't break that no matter what. Love and showing I, techniques like this. You know, one, I can peel it apart and break apart, just tear apart the fibers and just get it down to one single tiny strong thread. And I mean, that can be used as a suture if you've got a bad gash, or certainly for clothing or anything else you need sewn together. And if the edge here is just a little bit too, see that edge there? If that's just a little bit too thick, you can grind it down on a rock. And you got yourself one good strong needle and thread. Very useful plant. Now I'll also uh, take uh, the uh, one a couple of the leaves off because I can pound them and pull fiber, fibers out from the leaves as well that I can use for tying. This just breaks apart the agave leaf and as you can see underneath it is all kinds of fibers. They're really strong and can be used for great rope cordage material. Certainly this technique and these Lots techniques are there. an homage to the Pueblo people and different indigenous communities that, that uh, were here before colonization. 
But the, the reality of, of working with wild plants, useful plants, edible plants, medicinal plants, that is something that's in the heritage of us all. Every single human on this planet came from a background of gathering wild animal animal plants. Like a wild, wild boar is a, is a very aggressive animal, and this one is right in my area. Oh yeah, that's right. This guy did just come around, and that's how I got this footage. It was a matter of just being as quiet as I could and staying up high. Getting onto little rock ledges so that he couldn't see me. They can't look up, so that's your only defense. If you're on the ground with them, they'll chase you. I find that if I gorge on water, it tricks my stomach into feeling full. And at least for a time, the possibility of slowly starving to death seems distant. But a surprise in this hot, dry desert is just how much there really is to eat. Far more than way up in the boreal forests of the north when it comes to what you can pick or catch year round. Of course, not all of it is a choice meal. There we are. Little grasshopper. What you do, get as many of them as you can just hold them this way. You pull off the head, which pulls the stomach out with it. And this thing, which actually stays kicking for a while, is part of a meal. Uh, for now, oh, I know what I'll do. Once you get enough of them, you make yourself a little, well, it's kind of like a it's kind of like a fish stringer. Might be a bit big, this one. And you poke it through. There we go. And there's one. Let's see if I can get some more. All right. I'm sure it gets my shirt there. You can see it now. There we go, it's a nice little feast. There it is. Forever that's been the bane of, of filming these things is there's sunlight everywhere. And so like right now, I'm looking at you and there's a screen right here that I can see, that I can see myself. But when the sun's shooting in different ways, it's like you can hardly see, am I on camera, is it working? And so I discovered that if, as long as I put my hand up, I could show you something in front of my hand or against my shirt, that sort of thing. Uh, the little necessities that you have to do when you're filming yourself. And by the way, a side comment on that, something, a technique that I learned very quickly and that most, I'll say this way, most of you don't get when you're filming yourself. Stop doing this. You don't film yourself talking like this. It's unnatural, it's weird, but you're standing there, you're staring at yourself the whole time. You have to forget that that screen exists and only look at the audience, the viewer, just you have to train yourself to look at that. And sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll take and flip the screen, like right now I've just flipped the screen over. Just, I, I did that at first to train my eye to look at directly at the camera because otherwise it's very tempting to look over here all the time. So if you're filming yourself, try to remember that. Big juicy guy. Look at, they see they still keep kicking even after their heads are completely gone. So, here you go, there's my Grasshopper kebab. There's a lot of fathers that, and mothers who are not happy with me because their kids will go, come on, let's go out and catch some grasshoppers and eat them just like Survivor Man. Yeah, I've been told that story many, many times. Ha ha. All right, well. <sighs> Time for my little Grasshopper kebab, my little treat of the day. Now, I can roast it beside the fire, but this doing it this way on top of a rock, like a frying rock like that, is a, is a real cool and easy way to do it. So I think I'll just put these guys on there. Well, while I wait for these grasshoppers to roast up nicely on my little rock fire, I can show you these guys. And I picked these up on my way through from the first campsite. These are the beans from the mesquite tree. It's the legume family, good, good food source. Now these guys can be uh, ground up into a flour or just eaten raw. I think I gotta get back down to the desert and film a, a mm. wild harvest episode. Kind of sweet, actually, they're nice. Because this is, there's so many great things to eat down there. A and hard. it's a desert, you wouldn't think that, but it's true.
Now, what I want to do is just move that over. I'm going to give these guys just a last roasting just to make sure they're fully cooked because uh, they can carry tapeworms. So give these guys a last little roast here, but I think they're cooked pretty nicely. One of the tricks in a situation like this was being lethargic and not having any food in my stomach. And uh, over time of doing so many Survivor Man episodes, it was like my system just started to get used to it. And uh, it's like, oh, you're doing that again, are you? Okay, well, we'll try to hold on to some energy reserves because you're going to need it in four days. And uh, in between a lot of these scenes, I would have to sit down and just like, because <sighs> it took a while. It's like a lot of energy to press record on the camera and talk to the camera and do the fireball or whatever I'm doing. And then afterwards I'd be exhausted because, you know, one power bar for seven days, right? Uh, and a few grasshoppers. So that was a tough part of filming Survivor Man. Let's see here. Mm. It's actually quite tasty. And my big, big one here I got. Mmm, mm, mm, mm. When you're hungry. See the difference here? The shows that came along after, everything was, oh, it's gross, it's disgusting, uh, it was all of that. And the truth is, no, a lot of this stuff actually tastes pretty good. Grass, roasted grasshoppers taste good, roasted scorpions taste good. A lot of things taste good, and so there's no point in me being like, oh, it's, oh, it's so disgusting. I didn't have to sensationalize the food that I would, the little grubby foods that I was getting. If it was good, I said it was good. And, and if it wasn't, you knew it truly wasn't. Mmm, 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 mmm. Mmm, wings, legs, and all. Mmm, and there's thousands of those guys all around me. So I think I'll keep eating on them for a while. Bon appetit. You know, there is one insect out here that I don't want to run into at all. Killer bees, or Africanized bees. They are in Arizona. In fact, a friend of mine was stung by a number of them not too far from here. You never know what's going to set them off. Either a snap twig, walk a little too close to their hive, whatever it is, I don't want to find out. It must have been David that got stung. I don't remember who that was. I've been able to munch on grasshoppers today, and I ate more of those prickly pear cactuses. But I'm still not feeling much energy now. I'm getting pretty tired, and uh, week's starting to get long on me. So, one more full day, and they come and get me. I've got back a few needed calories from the grasshoppers and the mesquite beans, but it won't be enough. That's the last time I let this fire go out. That was easy. Old style uh, time lapse there before it got smoother. That's funny. The first time I dried it. There's always the worry that my fire will be out when I return to camp, so I'm going to try a traditional method of keeping fire. Keeping my mind active is still my best path to survival. Yeah, that's a thing, right? A lot of times you, you, you do things when you're on a long-term survival just to take up the time, to keep your mind active and busy and working. Otherwise, it becomes very lonely and, and depressing and, uh, and boring. Uh, and so even if you're working on something that you won't use or that won't help you that much, it helps you by the fact that your mind is being taken up with that activity. Show you what I can do with these prickly pear. Oh yeah, prickly pear cactus. Because these guys can be eaten as well. <laughs> Ow. Just cut off the rim here because I don't need it. And go around some of the spikes and spines. See how difficult it is to work with this type of plant. Can you believe this is actually what the natives farmed here? They would farm this prickly pear cactus because its fruits are so good and you can also do what I'm doing. Now I want to try and cut away the skin. Helps to have a good sharp knife for this. Well, here, just to show you what I can eat on this thing. Ah, move a few things out of the way. Now, there's still all these little veins, these white veins, and you don't actually want them either. 
there's actually a little line in between the two veins and that's the edible stuff. Not only that, but if you've got a bad cut you can, you can, or a burn, you can put it on it and it's uh, very cooling to the skin and helps to cool any kind of burns or cuts. These are the types of wild edible plants that I wasn't always that thrilled about. The ones that required a ton of processing. Uh, in this situation, I just wanted to show you quickly stuff you could get to, to survive, but when it requires a ton of processing, the good side, side of that is you could take a lot of time to take up your mind while you process. The downside is it takes a long time to process. And uh, so I, I would show them, but I was more a fan of something like grasshoppers that you could eat rather quickly. Pull a piece off like that. Because it was all about survival, not about field cookery. Les Child's Wild Harvest is about field cookery. You can uh, eat this raw or you can put it in, gather it all together and put it in a pot and boil it and boil the slime off. But you know, it's not bad, uh, not bad raw either. Here, keep watching, be right back. Check this out. Fire bundle, worked absolutely perfectly. If it flamed up, I kind of snuffed it out a bit, and now all I have to do is add some twigs and some grass and blow it into flame, and, uh, and I'm in business. Worked like a charm, one big fat cigar. Crikey, this here's your most classic Black Widow spider web. Now I'm not gonna make eye contact, I'm gonna back away slowly. No, seriously, this is a classic black widow spider web. It's all gnarly and messed up. She's hiding in there somewhere. Her bite is about 15 times more powerful than that of a rattlesnake. It's just such a little bite, but uh, it's a potent one. You know, you can actually take old webs and kind of spin them up and even make a little string out of them. It's a very, very strong, strong spun web. It's one of the things that has never happened to me in a Survivor Man episode is getting bitten, getting stung. Uh, I've been chased by big bull moose and, and some bigger animals. But, uh, and the reason for that is caution. I'm very, very cautious when I'm out there. I'm very careful about that. I don't want to stir up a, a, a beehive. and I don't want to be bitten by a spider just because I put my hand in the wrong place or a rattlesnake. And so even in the Amazon jungle, that's the key. You know, be boring out there and you stay safe. You know, about the worst thing about it being December here in the desert is that critters like scorpions are looking for nice, warm places to crawl into at night, like under some guy sleeping. Well, it's my last full day, and it's a frosty, frosty morning, let me tell you. You know, it amazes me during this desert winter how much there is to gather and eat in terms of wild edibles. Up in Canada in the boreal forest, you've got maybe six weeks to gather wild edibles. After that, if you don't hunt and you don't fish, you starve. I will say something about uh, this, this uh, episode, and I'm just realizing as I'm watching it, this actually was the first episode I shot outside of Ontario. So I'd shot my two pilot episodes, Stranded Summer and Winter. I'd shot the boreal forest where I dumped the canoe. Uh, and then this was the next episode that I filmed, and I went out of the country to film. It's my first time leaving Canada to go on a film shoot, ever. It was really quite a thrill. I felt like a pro. You know what you can also get some food source from as well is simple grass. You don't actually swallow the, uh, the grass blades, but you chew on them for as long as you can and um, get the juices, which is essentially chlorophyll, which is very good for our bodies. Once you're done chewing, we spit the, weed, spit the uh, blades out. Oh, cold and fresh. I always love the shots of me drinking water, especially from streams and that. To me, it, 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 it epitomizes my connection to the natural world. 
And so I always wanted to get that shot of my face in the water or drinking from a stream because it's just there, there I am, connecting to the natural world, taking in nutrients and liquid and, uh, and staying alive because of the natural. It was a very direct relationship. I always, always loved that. You know, utilizing our natural environment to survive in and doing things like eating live scorpions, or cutting down live trees are only necessary if you truly have to survive. I've shown some ways of surviving a very harsh climate. While you're out, leave only footprints. Let's set up some good protected areas so that our grandchildren also have this beauty to enjoy. It's not like I don't still feel that way. Uh, boy, some of you would get upset when I would say that. And it's like, oh, I never said I was against hunting for sustenance. I just said, if you don't have to kill, why kill? And uh, uh, so it, to me, the connection to the natural world is vital and important whether you're hunting big game or picking plants or chopping down trees to make a shelter. Is, you know, it, the thing is you don't have to do any of those activities and be cavalier about it. Let's be respectful about it. That's all I was ever saying and still am saying. I think the toughest part of the last day was knowing that I had to hike all of my camera gear all the way back to the first location to meet up with the crew and there's like this small thing in the back of my head, okay, are they gonna be there? The crew was just David Halliday. Because <laughs> I, I, I don't wanna do another night out here. And so I had that to look forward to, the fear. Is the crew there or aren't they there? One way or the other, I have a long hike and I had to get all the way back to the first location. Okay, let's see, I wanna see who edited this. Okay, produced by, edited by, yep, yeah, this, this is edited by Jake, not Richard. So it's actually, you know what, I take it back, Jake. It's, it's actually a much better version, better than I remember. I think the arguments must have happened right in the very first episode. And um, one of the things that, uh, that Jake really struggled with was showing the cameras. Like, if you look at this angle here, you can see this camera here, right? And he hated that. He's like, no, no, the audience can't. And I'm like, no, this whole series is about breaking down the fourth wall. Uh, additional camera, Glenn Crawford. I must have flown Glenn down there for those opening scenes. So maybe, maybe that, maybe Glenn. Let's see, Glenn. Was, I know David wasn't there. And there's, let's see. You now that's all just at the office. People. Maxine Crook. Wow, what a wonderful lady she was. Survival consultant Michael Corrali. I don't know, Michael, where you are now, but Michael uh, Kirale, 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 um, uh, military, ex-military, and uh, he was a cool dude. I liked him a lot. Um, learned a lot of survival techniques from him. There we go. Location survival consultant Dave, Dave Holliday. I think I must. I think that's a spelling error. David Holliday. Look him up. He's brilliant. Michael motorcycle consultant Mark Lanier. That was the dude who actually drove the motorcycle because I couldn't. Oh, uh, there we go. This is back. Okay, so I did, it wasn't all padded music. I had Peter Cleish and Dan Columbia, brilliant writers, brilliant. And I worked with them much beyond this as well. And, uh, uh, oh yeah, that opening animation by Mike Stanley, which Mike had to do kind of clandestine because he was working full time as a graphics design artist for, for a, a network or somebody like that. And so Mike Stanley did the opening graphics for me for Survivor Man, all the seasons, Survivor Man, Bigfoot Beyond Survival. It's brilliant, brilliant work, but he had to do it on the sly because he wasn't supposed to be sharing his talent, if you will, which is ridiculous. All right. Ah, look at that, back in the days. Les Strauss clothing and equipment provided by Mountain Equipment Co-op. I was gonna mention that actually, is that you know, back in the day, before I, before I did Survivor Man, when you're young and you're trying to do these adventure films, you'll even just take free gear. That's a big thing. If you can get some free gear, free kayak, free paddles, free clothing. And uh, I developed a relationship with Mountain Equipment Co-op out, out of Canada. They're fantastic. They're like the Canadian version of REI if you're an American. And um, amazing gear. And yeah, you know, they gave me all just tons of stuff for free uh, that uh, I didn't have any money. I mean, by the way, understand something. In this era of my life, I was still under the poverty line and what money I took home to survive on with two kids at home and a wife that didn't work. And I was still making under the poverty line. And now I'm a TV celebrity. Try to reconcile all that. It's weird. So getting some free clothing from Mountain Equipment Co-op was pretty cool because it was great gear. St they still make great gear. All right. Uh, produced and associated with OLN. Anastambolic. Oh, 
I will adore you forever, Anna. Without you, Survivor Man would never have existed. So there you go, guys. There is the Arizona episode. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes I do go and I'll check your, uh, your posts and stuff like that. And when you say stupid, dorky stuff, I delete them. But when you ask really good questions, I will come on. And, and uh, that's me answering, not my office. So feel free to throw, throw a few questions down there. Check out the links. Remember, this YouTube channel has a ton of playlists. Go look at the playlist section and uh, start exploring. Go down that rabbit hole with me and have some fun. Or get the hard copy version for yourself for Christmas if it's getting close to Christmas. Don't know when you're watching this, but this is all of my films, it's all 76 of them. And I've done more since then, but there you go. I'll see you guys soon on the next Director's Commentary.